good group we have today. Good morning, future leaders of the church. I see a couple deacons and deaconesses and maybe a pastor. I don't know. Anyway, it's good to see you all. So I have a story today, and it is a true story about me, an experience that I had. The name of my story is A Fork and a Puddle. Okay? So, I was getting ready to go camping with the church group. I was so, so excited. It was uh, a youth event, actually. I was about 15 years old, and uh, I was racing around the house getting all my camping stuff, and I was super excited because I was going with my friends. So no mom and dad, can you believe it? I was going with my friends and then some of the other church leaders. And um, the deal was meals were going to be provided, but they said we're responsible for bringing our own eating utensils. Do you guys know what an eating utensil is? Like a fork and a spoon. So uh, I went to the bag where we usually have our plastic forks. And we were out. We didn't have any. But the problem was is I didn't have time to go to the store to buy plasticware for this camping trip because my friend and her parents were about to pick me up. I was looking at the time. So I zipped over to the drawer, the kitchen drawer, and pulled out a fork. And I got that fork, and my mom said, uh, 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 what are you doing? And I said, I'm going to grab the fork, and I'm bringing it camping. And she said, oh, no, 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 no. She said, those are my forks, and I have 12 of them. Well, that was the first time I learned that the forks were hers. I always thought they were for the family, like all of us. But apparently they were her forks, and she had 12. So I explained the situation. Mom, I have to use something to eat. I really need this fork. And she said, I will let you take the fork if you promise not to lose it. I said, I promise, that's easy. Of course I'm not gonna lose the fork. So I ran out the door with my fork. This is what I did. What do you mean? It was a cold day, so I had to make sure I had my coat on. Oh, there we go. Woo. I grabbed the fork and put it in my pocket. Nice and safe. And I said to myself, you know what? I'm just going to keep it in my pocket because that's where it's safe. So I got to the camping site, my friends and I, and, and oh, it was beautiful. It was absolutely beautiful. It was a little chilly, but there was a big, big lake, a big lake. And in fact, there was a three mile hike around the lake. So we decided we would do that. It was a bit chilly. Uh, as I said, so I made sure to button up my coat and checked my pocket. I've got my fork. Well, we hustled and bustled and we ran to and fro, up and down hills, in between trees. Sometimes we even got off the trail and climbed on some rocks, scattered all about. We tipped our fingers in the, in the water and it was super, super cold. We went all the way around the lake, three miles. And by the time we got back, we were starving to death. We were so, so hungry. So I got in line to eat, felt in my pocket. Uh-oh. The fork was gone. No! What am I going to do? My fork's gone. I promised Mom that I would not lose the fork. That fork could be anywhere. I was devastated. I couldn't believe it. So my friend said, you know what, we can, we can go on that tray and we'll, we'll find that fork. And I said, we're not going to find that fork. It could be anywhere. We were all over the place. She said, let's just do it real quick. It was starting to get dark anyway. So we took off running, looking, and I'm like, oh, we are not going to find this fork. I know we're not going to find the fork. We will not find the fork. So... She said, you know what, this is like after about 10 minutes, she said, you know what, we should just pray about it. And you know what I said? 
No, we're not going to pray about it. I said, that's ridiculous. I said, God does not care about a fork. And she said, okay. So we kept running. She turns to me again. She's like, you know what? We really should just pray about it. And I said, no. I said, well, do you pray about it. I'm not going to pray about it. <laughs> I'm not going to stop to pray about it. It's just silly. I said, it's just a silly fork. So run a little bit more. I got desperate. She jumps over a puddle like this. And I stopped and I said, let's pray. Mom's going to be really mad. We need to pray. So without a whole lot of faith, I bent down on my knees like this. And I looked in the puddle. And do you know what I saw? My sad face reflecting back up at me. My sad, worried face. Anyway, I closed my eyes, and I prayed, Dear Jesus, I know you've got a lot on your agenda today, but I really need this fork. If you could help me find this fork, I sure would appreciate it. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. And I opened my eyes, and lo and behold, look what I found in the puddle. The fork. Can you believe that? I can't either. <laughs> it was right there. Can you imagine if I made the choice not to pray? I would have jumped right over that puddle with my friend, and I would have never found that fork. Jesus stopped me right there, right where he knew I needed to be. So that, that's my story. Always pray about anything and everything God truly cares about every detail in your life. Thank you, Jesus, so much for caring so deeply for us. Help us to always remember to pray and to include you in our lives. In your name I pray, amen. It feels good to praise our God, doesn't it? Sing to him, give to him, talk to him. Now we get to hear from him. You know, there's one thing that we've learned in this series so far. If, if there's one thing, it would be this. It is really easy to replace the awe of God with the awe of self. It is easy to replace the awe of God with the awe of self. My dreams, my wants, my desires, this is by far the greatest battle. When we replace the awe of God with the awe of self, we end up replacing the awe of God with other things as well. Because we're hardwired for awe. We're hardwired for worship. We're hardwired to fear God, to, to be in this awe state of him. And when we re flip that around and we replace it, what we end up doing is we start looking for other ways to get that awe feeling that God has hardwired us for. So we replace it with the awe of others, thinking that someone else is, is going to satisfy only what God can. So we look to others to make us feel better about ourselves. We look to others for acceptance, for approval. We critique, we judge, we criticize others, we envy, we compare. We even act out in jealousy when we compare ourselves to others. We replace it with the awe of complaining, when things don't go our way, we don't get what we want, and we've learned that complaining is like anti-praise. It's going against what God has, is, is calling us to be. It kills our spiritual life, and it spreads, so it can kill someone else's spiritual life. And we learned it's a no-brainer. Don't be a complainer. The one before that was, and I, it took me a week to really finalize it, and I actually preached it in Bridgers, so I realized, don't be looking over there for what only comes through prayer. So there's that other one. And then one that I didn't get to speak on, um, but when we replace the awe of God with the awe of stuff. And not that stuff is inherently evil, but when we think that obtaining something is going to help shape our identity or complete us as a person or fulfill us or whatever it is that we're looking for, 
then ultimately what we're doing is we're, we're simply replacing that awe. But here's the deal. We could go on and on and on about all the many things that we could end up replacing the awe of God with. But today I want us to shift our focus and truly focus on the awe of God. We've said that we've been hardwired for it. We've said we've, we've, uh, that, that this is something that God wants us to keep. But, but ultimately what ends up happening is, is over the course of this series, we've been looking at all these other things and I've saved this last part, the best part, for now. Because what I want us, all of us, to be reminded and to be in awe of the gospel. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we take some time now to reflect through your scripture and through your word, I pray your Holy Spirit will open our hearts and our minds and give us a new hope, a refreshing hope. That, you're, that you would restore in us this vertical awe that only you can restore. That you would remind us today, maybe something that we've heard so many times, may we be reminded of just how amazing it really is. May we be in awe of you today. Speak through me today, Lord. I pray that you would anoint my lips and my mind, that the words that I speak would simply be from you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. We started this series in Genesis. We remember that God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters, and God began to create, and he began to speak things into existence, and that all-amazing God is speaking light into the world, and he's creating things, and he's separating things, and, and he's, he creates the foundation of the world, and then he fills it all up with animals and fish and birds and humans. And and at the entire end of creation, he looks at it and says, this is very good. And so he creates a special day that he can celebrate with his creation and have this intimate bond with them. They lacked nothing. They had everything. And yet, even in the perfect world that God has created, in the perfect sense that he has given the love and the freedom of choice, Eve finds herself in a particular situation where she replaces the awe of God with the awe of self, thinking that if she takes of the fruit and she eats it, she will be like God, knowing good from evil. And she replaces that awe with herself. And yet even, yet even with the replacement of God for self, this rebellion that was had, personal, mind you. This wasn't just a mistake that was made. This was, a, this was rebellion in the garden. And even in that, when he goes out and he seeks after Adam and Eve and he says, where are you? And they say, we're naked. And he says, who told you we're naked? She did it. That did it. All these different things trying to point the blame. God still, in his abundant mercy and love, creates a covenant, a prophecy, a promise that I will send someone who will bruise and crush your head. The prophecy that's found in Genesis chapter 3, this covenant, this beginning promise of a Messiah, someone who's going to come and take care of this sin problem, kicks off and starts, and it begins to flow through Scripture. And we see through different stories of how God comes to this man by the name of Abram and he tells him, I am going to make you the father of many nations. You are going to have descendants that you won't even be able to count as the number of the stars in the sky. This is what I'm doing. I'm going to extend the covenant that I made in the Garden of Eden and I'm going to bring it through you, Abram. And even though Abram replace the awe of God with the awe of self and trying to make that descendant thing happen with Hagar and having Ishmael and, and, and going and not trusting God in Egypt and lying and all those things, God was still faithful and gave him a son. 
And through that moment, just as God said, there would be an entire nation that begins to be built by one. This nation becomes stronger. We see the story of Joseph. God continues following, maybe not extending the covenant with Joseph, but using Joseph to bring about that. And then you have a nation who's sitting in Egypt, who is in slavery for over 400 years, just how God had told Abraham that it would happen that way. And the people cried out to God, and he heard their cries, and so he called a man by the name of Moses, who grew up in Egypt, who had to flee Egypt, and now God is calling him back to go before Pharaoh to let God's people go. He goes through the plagues. Finally, Pharaoh says, get out. They go. They're trapped. They complain. God opens the sea. They go through. They complain. He gives them water. They complain. He gives them food. They complain. I think you get the idea. They complain. They complain. They complain. And even when the children of Israel replaced the awe of God with the awe of self by making idols, while God was giving them the covenant, the Ten Commandments extension from Genesis 3, as they're doing that, they're making golden calves. They're disobeying. They're turning away from God. And how does God respond? This is how he responds in Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 and 7. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sins, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. When Moses is recapping the story again in Deuteronomy, is reminded of this, It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. For you were the fewest of all peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath or the covenant that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt." The children of Israel, as they go through the promised land and they inhabit it, they turn away from God again and again and again. And yet God in his infinite love and mercy kept bringing them back to him. Isaiah 63, 9 says, In all their affliction he was afflicted. The angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. Time and time again, Israel kept turning away from God to serve other gods. They kept replacing the awe of God with other things, other gods and other people. And yet time and time again, God kept taking them back. Time and time again, God would go after a rebellious nation to bring them back. Have you ever had to buy something back of something that was taken from you? Where's that coming from? Okay. Okay. So I told you the story uh, a few weeks ago that, um, I gotta get my COVID brain back. Hold on one second. I told you a, a story a few, a few weeks ago that our car was stolen. Now, I, we, when our, this was back in September and, and we get, we get, you know, they recovered the car and, and we have it now, we're driving it, it's, it's, it's all good. Um, <clears throat> but in, in the car, there were s- several things. One of the things that was in the car was our weight distribution hitch for our camper. And so I was thinking, you know, it's, it's just, it's a unique hitch, but, you know, there's a lot of them out there, but 
I really didn't want to go through the hassle of going and trying to find a new hitch and, and getting it all set up the, the same way and all that different things because I had, I had to do something specifically to this hitch to make it fit and all those things. And so I just didn't want to go through that hassle. And so what I started doing is I started scouring Facebook Marketplace. I said, this guy has got to sell my stuff at some point, right? I mean, they have it. What else are they going to do with it? So a couple weeks go by, and sure enough, my weight distribution hitch pops up on Facebook. And I can look and I can see and, and I, you know, called the police and I said, hey, I found my stuff. And they said, prove it. And I said, I just know, okay? <laughs> I just know, I just know. I can see like this little, this little nick here and this little scratch here and this. I just know that that's my hitch. And they said, yeah, well, you can't really prove that and, you know, all that different stuff. And so we were getting ready to head out of town. Plus they have, you know, they had our, our uh, they know our name. They know everything, you know, everything about us. So I can't message them. So I put Tyrell on it, on the duty. So I called Tyrell and I said, Tyrell, I need a favor, man. Would you be willing to go and would you be willing to try to get my hitch back? And so, you know, Tyrell starts to message him. And the guy was, was kind of shady and he was, he was kind of like, you know, didn't really want to make the deal or whatever. And and so anyways, what ends up happening is that Tyrell goes and I give him the money and he buys my hitch back. I had to go buy my own stuff back. And you know, that just kind of, you know, you've already bought it once. And then you have to go around and because someone took it, you have to go back and buy it again. And then you're just kind of like, just kind of maybe, I don't know, annoyed or maybe frustrated or angry a little bit and yet isn't that exactly how God describes it in the book of Hosea isn't that exactly what he said how how the nation has left how the woman has left right Gomer and 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 as she she goes and how Hosea has to go back and buy her back and bring her back home and in that same instance with Israel God continues to go and to bring them back and to get them back he doesn't get frustrated or angry the way that I did about a dumb piece of metal. We're talking about lives, souls, families. And God goes after him time and time and time again. Hosea 11, verses 1 through 4. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. The more they were called, the more they went away. They kept sacrificing to Baals and burning offerings to idols. And yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up by their arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of kindness, with the bands of love. And I became to them as the one who eases the yoke on their jaws. And I bent down to them and fed them. God's love time and time again. Even when the prophets begin to stop hearing. Because ultimately what they were doing is they were sh trying to share this news that was coming and no one wanted to hear them and they were, they were abusing and, and destroying and killing off the prophets and there's this time of silence between what we would call the Old Testament and the New. This Silence. Think about it. A nation who's always heard from God through prophets or even those that heard God through thunder at Mount Sinai. And now it's quiet. Nothing. And God chooses to interrupt the silence with a beating heart. The beating heart of Jesus. As Jesus came, born of a virgin, full of grace and truth, fully God and fully man, Jesus chose to live among his people, Amen. teaching, healing, discipling, feeding, resurrecting. And the Jewish nation now replaced the awe of God with the awe of self, jealous, trying to protect their religious organization, 
trying to protect their status, trying to, re- to protect their reputation. And knowing all of this ahead of time, it was God who chose to now extend that covenant that was created back in Genesis 3, extended through Abraham and Moses and David and Isaiah. And as all those covenants are extending all the way down, he now takes that covenant and he extends it, not just to a nation, but to the entire world. And he goes and we read those verses in John 3, 16 and 17, for God so loved the world. The world. This was a big moment for Nicodemus to hear. Because they've always been told that God would come to save his people, not the world. That they would come to save a nation, a descendants of Abraham, not the rest. And now as Nicodemus is wrapping his mind around what God is saying about the spirit and the water and all these things that that Jesus is breaking through into his life, he now hears these words, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. And even in this moment in Jesus' life, God's people betrayed the son of God and put him through an illegal trial and put him to death. But, As his blood was shed, and as the covenant that he made with the disciples in the upper room by pouring the wine out, he extended the covenant through his blood to you and to me. So that our sins, being placed upon the Son of God, would set us free from condemnation. Romans 8 Verses 1 through 4, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And so here we are, 2,000 years later, still replacing the awe of God with the awe of self. Here we are, worried, stressed, jealous, angry caught up in traditions, holding on to grudges, judging others, grumbling, complaining, caught up in materialism, looking for happiness and fulfillment in all the wrong places. We are busy, we are tired, and we are worn out. We are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold. We think we have it all together, yet the Bible tells us that we are wretched, poor, blind, and naked. And yet, even in all of the condition that we are in, and even though we have turned away from God, and even though we've replaced the awe of God with all these other things in our hearts and on our lives, here's Jesus. Still, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Even in the wretched condition that we are, Jesus is there knocking on the hearts of every single one of us. And he promises that if we open our hearts to him, he will will not even come in. He'll take up residence. He'll set up his own couch. He'll set up his own stuff and he'll even make a meal with you. I will eat with him. Because there's no more intimate thing that you can do with somebody else. At a table, you sit there and you just are dining with Jesus. My friends, this morning, this is the gospel. This is the good news. This is what life is all about. We have tried to make it about other things. 
We've tried to make it about ourselves. We've tried to make it about church. We've tried to make it about religion. We've tried to make it about stuff. We've tried to make it about others. We try to make it about all these other things. But let me tell you something. This life that we live, it all comes down to who God is. That he has extended a covenant with you and with me. When I look at the grand picture, and I wish we had time to go through all the many details of the picture of what God has done for us, I can't help but be in awe. It makes me want to change the way that I live, the way that I think, the way that I interact with others. I had to be so careful today that, I, that I, had, I didn't want to get this wrong. This was so important that I had to write every word for word today because I wanted to make sure that we understand, that we grasp, that we grasp the significance of what God has done through this book. That this is not just a story, that this is not just stories, but this is life. This is life giving and life changing and the reality is is the gospel is good news for you and for me jesus loves you and wants a new life with you our soul changes when the gospel touches it it's not about just being saved it's about experiencing a brand new life with jesus it's not about experiencing salvation for ourselves it's about being a conduit of god's grace and power to those around us our neighbors our co-workers our family members it's not just about keeping a day holy it's about taking 24 hour period of delighting and resting and worshiping our god and remembering him as our creator being in awe of the maker of the heaven and the earth it's not about refraining of, of eating or drinking certain things it's about having the holy spirit living in us thriving in our hearts and our minds it's not about avoiding hellfire it's about living for eternity with our god it's not about being concerned about the time of the end it's about looking forward to a god who stands up for his people to take us home it's good news Jesus wins. It's good news. And there's no better story. There is no better life. There is no greater promise than the promise of Jesus Christ. His death, his burial, his resurrection, and his promise of his soon return. God keeps his promises. God keeps his covenant with his people. That's good news. That's something, my friends, to be in awe over. So I want to invite you today to be in awe of the gospel. That when we think about what God has done for you and for me, what does that spark here in your heart? We've been rebellious people. We have turned from God. We've done our own thing. We've gone our own way. We have replaced the awe of God and yet here he is coming back for you and for me today. He's coming back to buy the hitch. He's coming back to get you and to get me to restore us back to him, this vertical relationship. So the question is, is what, do we, what else could we do but give praise and thanks to a God who gave up everything for you and for me? We get distracted over so many other things. Different teachings, different theologies, different doctrines, all these these little things. And let me just remind you that I'm not trying to negate those things. I'm not saying they're not important. What I'm saying is God is most important. And our relationship and our connection with him and the fact that he chose to send his son to live among us, to, to do what had to be done so that we could have everlasting life, let's be in awe of that. Let's live a life that's in awe of our God. That when distractions come, we say, I see those things, but I choose to be in awe of my God. When jealousy strikes at my heart, I choose to be in awe of my God. When fear raptures or enraptures my heart and my soul, I will say, I choose to be in awe of my God. 
When I feel like grumbling and complaining, may I be in awe of my God. When I try to replace the the awe with someone else in my life, thinking if that person would just do this or if they would just do that, I'm going to put that aside and be in awe of my God. God, you made a covenant with Adam and Eve, and you make that same covenant with me today. You have washed me clean, and you have a promise to come and get me again. I'm in awe of that. That's why we're here. That's why we're here. We're in this place to give glory and honor to a God who has been so faithful to us even when we have not been faithful to him. And so when we leave this place today and we have the awe of God in our hearts and our minds, it's time to let go and forgive grudges, complaining. It's time to lay those things down to be in awe of God who wants to restore us completely.